passionate presentation and of course walked us through the very rich profile of our keynote speaker. And I want us to give them a round of applause. Can we celebrate Professor Bagakas in a very serious way? Now, can we mold flowers for Professor Bagakas? Dr. Zippy, you know what you should do. We want to mold flowers for Prof. Bagakas. Dr. Zippy, you, please just come, just come. I know he's your boss, but uh, uh, today you have, nobody will summon you. You will actually, you never know, your paycheck may go up, uh, depending on uh, how well you mold these flowers. Let's mold flowers, Dr. Zippy Way. Let's mold these flowers for Professor Bagakas. Let's mold the flowers. You know, we mold flowers for the people we love. Mold those flowers very nicely, in a scholarly way. Let's give them to Professor Bagakas. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we once again want to thank you for coming. I will quickly recognize those who are in attendance, just running through very, very fast. Um, we have uh, Sebastian. If I mention your name, just be upstanding and wave so that we move. We have uh, Sebastian from the University of Nairobi. Let's give him a round of applause, please. We have Dr. Peter Karioki, University of Embu. We have um, uh, George Gasheru, KCA University. We have Elfas Lisa, Elfas Lisa Lisa. Hey, this is a serious one, huh? Elfas from KCA University. Then uh, we have Ami Vundi, um, Ami Vundi African Nazarene University. Let's give a round of applause, please. Christine Yamoma, KCA University. Stephen Karenju, KCA University. Cynthia Ojanji, KCA University. Dr. Fred Spotter, KCA University. Dr. Ibrahim Ondabu, KCA University. Irene Wambue, KCA University. Jane Massa, KCA University. Stephen Mutiso, Jay Quartz, Stephen Mutiso, and I will jump quickly to non-KCA fraternity because the list is uh, slightly long. I think I will end it there for now, but we want to celebrate all of you for having come. We, um, we have a gentleman, Melinda, from Radio Africa. Melinda from Radio Africa. Let's give a round of applause. Now, when you see this story on the media, I can tell you, you will know whose work that is. So as you sit, as you laugh, as you smile, do it in a very scholarly manner because the media is here to watch. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to um, go to the next phase of our program. And uh, we just want to mention that Professor Bitang Demo will be joining us live from Belgium at exactly 12.15 p.m. At this point, we are going for plenary presentations. And I want to invite my uh, co-program manager, a very wonderful, lovely, lady who is a great scholar and depending on how you appreciate her she may choose to take up or decide just to walk away ladies and gentlemen let's put our hands together for dr christine nanjala so thank you very much uh, buana rogers for the good introduction so delegates we are moving on to the next session we are going to have two presentations in the plenary before uh, Professor Bitangendemo joins us from Belgium. So the first presentation will be by Dr. the Senior Lecturer in Finance from Embu University. Then the next presentation will be by Dr. Zipora Okot uh, from KCA University. So let's all put our hands together to welcome our first presenter, uh, Dr. 
Peter Karyuki. Good morning. Yes. Um, okay. So, um, Peter Karyuki, and um, I think I would say that I have dual citizenship because in over and above being in University of Embu, I'm also a good friend of this university, KC University, which I'm proud of. Um, today I want to present a paper on uh, diversification, human uh, capital efficiency, and performance of banks in Kenya. And uh, the motivation for the paper is the fact that, uh, well, uh, a lot of uh, academic discourse has been extended to the fact that um, how is diversification important, the essence of how human capital comes in to support the diversification strategies has not been uh, adequately uh, addressed. And uh, the biggest question is, should banks diversify across products, regions, or focus on a particular line of business? And we find uh, theoretical underpinnings of this from uh, modern portfolio theory, uh, which simply says that when you combine imperfectly correlated assets, then you're able to enhance returns and reduce risks. But there's also the strategic management view, which argues that um, when you extend interrelated lines of business, then you're able to enjoy economies of scale and you identify or you enjoy um, superior performance that arises from the same. But on the contrast, when you look at the agency theory, uh, diversification by the virtue of the fact that it is extending the scope of operations is likely to bring in information asymmetry, loss of comparative advantage, and by so doing, detriment the performance that you are seeking for. So it's in the light of this that um, we want to look at diversification taking different forms. So in my paper, I look at differentiation, uh, diversification in three aspects. One is what we call the branching out, which is the geographical dispersion of the bank branches. Of course, in an effort to enjoy the economies and reduce the economies and reduce the exposures to regional economic stabilities. The second one is income diversification where banks really, we know that the core in incomes of the bank is interest income. So income diversification would be moving to fees, services, trading revenues, and other forms of non-interest incomes. Then there is the off-balance sheet, off-balance sheet activities, which is one of the best ways that the bank can be able to use because we know that banks are highly regulated. And the regulator requires that once the bank increases its scope of operation, they generate or they have sufficient capital to cover for any possible risks. And therefore, any form of activities that are within the balance sheet or the statement of financial position has to be covered by adequate capital. And therefore, one of the ways that the banks can be able to go around regulatory requirement is to go through the off-balance sheet activities. And this would include uh, activities such as debt by letters of credit, commercial letters of credit, loan commitments, and derivatives. So what do I seek to achieve? Four hypotheses. The first one is that um, diversification has a positive influence on bank profitability. Second, it has a positive influence on bank stability. Third one, it has a positive influence on bank efficiency. So we're looking at performance from three perspectives, profitability, stability, and efficiency. Then we ask ourselves, what happens when we bring in the human capital? We know that the biggest challenge, we know that it's, it's, it's known, it's a fact that's known that in every institution, human capital is the biggest asset. But the question is, how well, how efficient is this capital? And how does it contribute towards the performance? So in the third, fourth hypothesis, 
we seek to see whether human capital efficiency has a positive uh, moderating effect on the relationship between diversification and performance. So how do we measure these variables? Um, three, three aspects of uh, performance, profitability, I'm going to, uh, I've used three measures, uh, return on asset, return on equity, and net interest margin. Stability, I use uh, Z-score, uh, um, which is the uh, different from the Altman Z-score. Uh, this then I use the Z-score th uh, that is risk adjusted, funding risk adjusted, that's Z-score F-risk. Then I use um, a decomposition of the Z-score, La Loa and La Ia. Uh, basically we're going to see the formulas in a minute. Then the efficiency. For efficiency, we know there are two basic ways that we can be able to look at efficiency, either parametrically or non-parametrically. And I'm, I've, I've used uh, stochastic frontier analysis, the SFE, to be able to generate the efficiency scores that I'm going to use while I'm using in the paper. Three forms of diversification, as we had mentioned earlier, income, uh, off balance sheet, income, and branching out. And then human capital efficiency, how do we measure it? We take the value added, you divide by the human capital, where the value added is the difference between the gross income, less operating and personal expenses. Then the um, human capital is measured by um, the actual expenditure that goes to human resources within an organization. Those are personal expenses. There are other, a host of other control variables, so I'm not going to go into them because they are just there to help us to ensure that we single out the effect of capital adequacy, asset risk, management ability, asset quality, all those are control variables including macroeconomic uh, variables. So just a, an appreciation of uh, how we are measuring the stability. The first one is uh, the Z-score, which essentially looks at the variability of uh, the returns on asset and uh, to what extent can the return on asset reduce uh, before the bank is wipe, wipes its, its capital. And that's the essence that it's measuring the stability. Because if the bank's uh, profitability does vary so much, then wiping up the entire capital, then definitely that bank will fail. And the decomposition of the same, the lower, which is the return on asset, divided by um, the standard deviation, which you have used uh, a low-link standard deviation over the period, and also the early year, which is basically the earnings, um, the equity of a total asset, and again, the uh, variabilities of asset. The fourth way is the funding risk, which basically looks at uh, how um, the deposit would have to reduce uh, before the bank's whites or one, um, exhausts its regulatory capital. So the, the data that um, I've used in the study uh, comprises of uh, 35 commercial banks that has been in operation. The data covers the periods 2005 to 2020. And uh, as although we are aware that as at December 2020, there were 41 commercial banks, the span of the period to ensure that we do not have a short panel, um, uh, and, and also for banks that have been in liquidation or in receivership, they were dropped, uh, leaving 35 banks for which had data for the entire period. So this is our empirical model, and uh, what you're able to see, we have the branching out, the income diversification, the off-balance sheet diversification, the human capital efficiency, and the interactions, because the interactions are the ones we are most interested with between branching and human capital efficiency, between income diversification and human capital efficiency, between off-balance sheet diversification and human capital efficiency, and a host of other control variables. So we then generate some um, charts to be able to help us figure out the study variables over the period, and um, uh, they may not be very visible, but the first one is on performance, that is the return on assets, return on equity, and uh, net interest margin. Uh, and uh, what probably is notable is that um, uh, they have largely remained the same. If you look at the close the, peri the period, the one that is up here is the return on equity, the one that seems to be more, more um, it seems to, to vary significantly, uh, owing to the fact that uh, there has been significant changes of um, um, the bank uh, capital requirement over the period. But um, of course, it's evident that around this period here, around this period here, there is a dip that has came as a result of performance, which could be attributed to the interest rates uh, caps that was, were introduced in September 2016, 
and then we can now see the effect of the COVID because the 2020 data is included. You can see a dip uh, that happened there. And the same case applies to cost efficiency uh, using the stochastic frontier analysis. Um, basically, the um, Berlin going up to in the area 2007, interestingly, 2007, 2008, the, uh, where the global financial crisis was creeping in. Uh, in Kenya, we did not have such a huge impact in terms of efficiency. And even performance, if you look at that, there's no big uh, uh, dip in performance, meaning that um, the, uh, what you call the contagion effect did not really land here. Then this one is the, the Z score on uh, bank stability. Uh, this one is um, also uh, not um, very significant growth. Diversification, where we have off sheet diversification, and diversification. What you'll notice is there seems to be a constant movement between balance sheet activities and income. So when the income diversification is going down, off balance sheet activities is, um, is, 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 is moving up. And um, um, again, when you look at around 2016, you can notice that significant uh, income because the banks were had to be forced. Now that the main income stream, which was the interest income, was constrained, they had to look at a way that they're able to uh, counter that, and that brought about a huge uh, change in the income diversification by moving into non-fusion incomes. Uh, the number of branches, the geographical uh, diversification, um, we noticed that uh, though there was a, a growth in uh, early 2000 and uh, up to 2012, in the recent past, banks have been reducing the uh, branches, of course, owing to the innovations and uh, the fact that today we don't have to basically go and visit a bank to have a physical um, uh, access to your funds. Basically, the number of branches are smaller. Human capital uh, seems to also be in a constant way uh, of an average to be maintained, although uh, it seems to have been a the COVID, um, just before the COVID, we got that significant trade down from 2 billion to 2020 to 6 billion down. So those are the, um, the main variables for the study and how they, uh, they, they looked at. Now, for purposes of empirical, um, to enhance the nature of the data, appropriate um, uh, model classification tests were carried out. The first was to ask whether we can use a, pool, a pooled OLS model. And indeed, after using the branch sheet and uh, target sheet test, we found that uh, the pooled OLS is not appropriate. So the next question is that we could use random effect or fixed effect model. And we decide that we should use fixed effect. And uh, when we now say fixed effect, yes, then the question is, do we need uh, time fixed effect? Do we need to charge the dummies? And indeed, the dummies are needed uh, to take uh, into account the time fixed effect. But now, when you come to homo uh, heteroskedasticity, um, we detect heteroskedasticity in the data. Uh, when it comes to linear polarization, we detect linear polarization. When it comes to cross-sectional dependence, we detect cross-sectional dependence. So that means that the, the normal models or the ordinary model, the static um, uh, um, actual regression model of fixed effect and uh, random effect would as the uh, investment or the efficient estimators, and therefore we don't really have to look for alternatives. The alternative is to use the FGS, the physical generalized distribution error, or we what we are able to get from the classification test. Now, these are the results. Uh, they are truncated because, as, as you remember, you can see so many variables, but because of the ability to, to fit on, uh, on um, a PowerPoint presentation, I had to uh, truncate it so that we could remove from the format. Our interest was to look at how that diversification affects performance and then how when you do this
Maybe a lot of people study this and realize it's not true, but they do. They do. People study the Greek Bible. Group study the Greek Bible. Whole study the Greek Bible. Group study the Greek Bible. Uh, I don't know how much research the Greek Bible teaches, but I know that it's not true. The Greek Bible is not true. Let me just say this. Let me now say it in positive terms. This is not true. I have not found it. I mean, a coefficient is equal to the Greek Bible. The coefficient that the Bible prints from negative to positive is the same. Let me just tell you. one now presents um, a thesis for peace study research where probably it will be interesting to see because this was generated using the Kenya Peace Policy Analysis. Uh, what would happen if you try to do um, 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 a thesis on peace study research using a method of the analysis that is completely different from the Greek
整个华为品牌所产生的这个 IP 与这种品牌的品牌形象是非常的不一样的。For all those brands, we know that、um, if there is a regulator or the bank or the central central regulator in this country, which focuses on um, um, handling data such as、uh, personal and other data, we know what is happening in Sri Lanka. Then how are they talk about this kind of business? So therefore, we are saying that、um, one of the regulatory、um, um, steps that will come to be able to control this is when you compete with brand across this nature. Just as you could have across this record of、uh, particular data, just as this record of liquidity, across this record of asset quality, then we could also talk in terms of asset control. Then we talk across this at the optimal level of business cycle efficiency, and then ensure that we have a monitoring system. Of business capital efficiency, and that we can、um, um, have the ability to continually、uh, surveil the bank to ensure that the, the bank has、um, um, performance data. Well, thank you very much,、uh, Dr. Kiusi. Thank you so much to talk to、uh, Dr. Kariki Madikaye, and we are going to do it the Nyayo style. So we go. Thank you very much for that nice presentation. And the first thing first is that、uh, human capital efficiency is key to bank performance. So we are going to have、uh, some two, three questions. Then、uh, we move forward to the next presentation. Anyone with a question, you just raise up your hand. Good morning, people. Good morning. Thanks for the opportunity for my first presentation. I'm a little corner Liberian, and、um, it was、um, the main thing that made me to、um, make an observation. Now,、uh, when I look at one of your examples, the number of brands you have,、uh, I'm trying to imagine. There's a lot of big banks in this country. Now, we do take into account the actual situation of these countries to make that governance. You can imagine if a bank has、um, 47 branches in Nairobi, vis-a-vis -vis a branch in each of the banks, and if the one starts in Kawaita, geographical dispersion could be、uh, deemed to be more more than that. So, would you have any measure? Of、uh, how far these branches are from each other.、Um, okay, now、uh, going to the issue of the model, I, I noticed that、um, you put out a single model、um, where you have、uh, the interaction with banks, the interaction with clients.、Uh, in fact, when I look at the hypothesis,、uh, all three of these hypotheses you are looking at are all. Result as a pending, uh, uh, a, a, a distinct dependent variable. So I, I would imagine that if you're looking at the、uh, at the effect of、uh, how these regressors are influencing the dependent variables in the absence of interaction points, that would give a better better、um, uh, estimates of、uh, of、uh, regressors as far as the direct effect is concerned. Now、uh, looking at The those time plots of the variables, they look like what we call a random walk with a deterministic tread. So, did you envisage any colleges to do with stationarity? Because to me, all the variables appeared as if they have a unique trip, and、uh, that can cause your results to be spurious. So,、uh, did you?、Uh, What did you assure? Because there is that time dimension. What did you do to assure that、um, there is stationarity? Finally, this is my final thing.、Um, <coughs> usually, we fit the feasible generalized least squares when there is a residual correlation 
or like basically some assumptions are violated. So in this case, what warranted the FH FGLS? Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's take another question when we answer all of them. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kanifi, for that great presentation. Uh, I looked at your hypothesis, and in research, we normally have a concept known as falsification, where you state the false hypothesis so that you can prove, uh, you can test and prove that it is false. So yours were direct and directional, and my question is, uh, why did you choose to make them that directional? And where did they go? Because at the point of uh, dissent in your findings, I never heard you refer to the hypothesis either being rejected or uh, accepted. Thank you. So let's take those first. Thank you. Th thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Kaiboni. Uh, quite a number of questions, some of them definitely will be room for improvement. Uh, one is about the actual dispersion and uh, whether that really always implies geographical dispersion. Um, first, it's difficult to filter into the geographical dispersion uh, because of the nature of the data. When uh, the banks tells us we have 10 branches, then we may not be able to see how diverse is one. Geographical disperse is one from the other. But that could be a room for now uh, further study. But generally speaking from um, um, a logical or rational point of view, uh, the bank will only go for branches uh, where um, they want to reach geographically dispersed population. So by the nature of the, the bank has many branches, the rationale would expect that they are geographically dispersed. Uh, number two is that uh, we do not have, uh, we have a single model that is just uh, capturing both the single effect or the, <coughs> the single interaction effect and also the moderating effect. Um, in, in, the, in the actual paper, I, I presented two models, uh, but now for purposes of uh, presentation here, we only go for the one that is uh, uh, the ultimate one because you keep on, you build. You start with the one without interactions, then you build into the one that has interactions. So what I've presented is the one that has um, interactions. Then um, the issue of uh, why FGLS. Um, once the assumptions for the static uh, regression models um, are diluted, in this case we had uh, multiple correlation, we had uh, cross-sectional dependence, and we had heteroscedasticity, you find that it becomes difficult to correct those static models. That's why the, 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 inf uh, the information, that's what informed the FGLS. Uh, but actually I'm thinking that about that more critically because I, was th I think also it may be important to consider uh, a dynamic model, a dynamic model uh, such as um, a two-step system GMM is likely to counter uh, those, those, uh, those, those challenges. And I think uh, as, as, we, as I improve this paper towards uh, publication, uh, I'm, I'm considering using a two-step system GMM, which is a dynamic model and is likely to uh, um, or deal with those uh, issues. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Wino. The question on hypothesis. Um, well, you, there are two ways. You can either present a two-tailed test for hypothesis or a one-tail. So what I went for is a one-tail so that already, and, and why, what, why, what informed the direction? Just the development of the hypothesis is based on the literature review. So you look at uh, past studies, then look at the direction that they have been able to find, and therefore you project, you are likely to get a similar, a similar. Um, as to whether um, the reference is made to whether they are accepted or not, that definitely come into the, uh, the, the lengthy paper or the full paper, because it requires a bit of space. And uh, by the virtue of the fact we are talking about significant or not significant, uh, indirectly we are making references to those hypotheses. So thank you for the question and I appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kariuki. I think uh, that's the end of the first presentation for the interest of time. So let's move on to the second presentation.
uh, by Dr. Zipora. Oh, oh. Zipora, you're next. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Zipora Okot and I'm here to do a presentation. Yeah, my presentation is on the influence of Mr. President Reality TV show on women leadership in Kenya, in Kenyan politics. Uh, Ms. President Reality TV show is a Kenyan show on KTN Home coming every Thursday at 8 p.m. It is produced by Media Focus on Africa, who have got over 20 years on producing reality TV shows. I think a lot of you might be able to remember some of the shows that was hosted by Louis Yotieno some time back. What was the name? Yeah, I, I, I can't remember. Yeah, but uh, they, are, they have got that experience. So when they plotted this uh, uh, show, it was easily absorbed and it is funded by the European Union and Canadian Embassy because they believe in women leadership. So the show uh, goes around and uh, it looks for women from all over Kenya, from all the 47 counties, and people apply. The first season, there were over uh, 500 applicants and the second season had over 700 applicants. Yeah, so the first season had over 700 applicants, 500, the second season had over 500 applicants. And out of that, they look at the papers, the qualifications of each person, and in the end, they take 100 applicants who they take for training on leadership, governance, uh, policy, economy, public speaking, presentation, and uh, basically even all the challenges of women leadership. And then after that, they take the top 50 and take them into the reality TV show where each time, every week, they are given a training and an exercise based on that training and people are eliminated. So they keep eliminating until they get the winner of the Miss President's title. So out of that, we get to have 47 women who at least are having the Miss President's title like Miss President Nairobi County, Miss President Nyeri County, and ETC. So this show has been going on for now. The first season was in 2019, and the second season is ongoing this year in 2022. And it has had a lot of impact because we have had a lot of women getting into the uh, into leadership. I'm sorry, I'm so terrible with um, PowerPoint, not even this full at PowerPoint in itself. Yeah, but I'll, I'm a storyteller, so don't focus there. Focus here. Yeah. So. Uh, so we have had many women apply for this. So when they say problem statement, uh, well why did I choose to do this study? Because uh, many of the contestants have excelled in their leadership roles in government and uh, even in, their private, in the private sector. However, when they got to this uh, reality TV show, they learned a lot and they have risen to even more bigger prominent roles. And then... Uh, the, the, so my question is, is the show a contributor to their rise in leadership? Because this year's elections, we had got more women coming out. But then again, no study has been done so far on this show, except, of course, for the monitoring and evaluation that was done by the funders and the people who created it. So when, when I look at it, I'm like, what is the impact of the Miss President show? Because when we look at the people who are in the first season, we have got a lot of people who have been able to get positions. We have uh, Rene Mayak and Omohel Mohamed who have been nominated as uh, MPs in the National Assembly. We had Betty Adera who is a chief whip for the U.S. Embassy. We have Lynette Mavu who was elected to be the in IGRTC, that is Intergovernmental Relations Technical Committee as the chairperson. And we have got Waruguru Wakiai who is the chief advisor for the Governor Meru. So if these are the top six from season one and they have gotten into that big kind of leadership, the question is, is it because of the Miss President show or is it because of their personal initiative? So we believe that the Miss President show may have catapulted them to get into a very high position because from that very first season, they were able even to meet the president. So it was not even just a TV show, but when the reality of the ground, the, 
the president, President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, former president Uhuru Kenyatta, was able to meet them at State House and even go with them on a campaign trail. It gave a, a certain affirmation on women leadership because that was a reality TV show and not just an, a, a, a drama. So the main objective is to evaluate the influence of this president, reality TV show trainings on leadership and government. First of all, uh, I'm focusing on the trainings because it is not just the show. A lot of people watch the show because of the trainings, which takes about 30 minutes of the show. And even in season two, the trainings are taking a whole one hour, put separately, even on YouTube, for people to look at and to understand issues of women leadership. This informs even men and even women. But they also to examine the influence of the show on the contestants who got political positions. Uh, even right now, we have got a lot of MCS who've gotten political positions right now, even from the from from the season we have got like in Kajado County there is uh, a CEC who's been, been nominated and they are from uh, the Miss President show and quite a number of them and they also to assess the perception of audience on the show in regards to women leadership this is because when the top five well when the, the others have been limited and they were only left in the top five the audience are the ones who had the say on getting the leader through votes then to examine the contribution of the Miss President show on the Kenyan political leadership arena. We believe that from the show, a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, the like this year's elections, we had a lot of people, a lot of women elected. We have got how many governors? Seven elected, not nominated, elected. And I think it's because people are more empowered to understand that women leadership. Uh, so now, okay. Mosonga? So basically, just asking why do women feel the need for training leadership and governance, and what is the, reali the role of TV shows on women leadership, and then to assess uh, that on the perception of uh, people. Then the design is a case study research design, which is a qualitative research because mu much of it is going to be like talking to people, just hearing their personal stories and perspectives, and also talking to the audience and even the people who did not make it to top ten to understand that what, has, what was the impact of the show on their leadership roles, whether it is at a political, like high political office or non-political high office. I believe politics is not just a national governance. We have even politics at KC University, which are private university. So politics is not just about uh, uh, siasa. So we will have got uh, uh, interviews from, uh, for the contestants, the top five from the previous season. We will also have interviews on uh, those who did not make it to top five, at least 10 of them who made it to top 50. We are also going to have a survey sending to uh, the public. We are going to, uh, to uh, w sorry, we had 100 people respond to the survey, 100 people, because we didn't want too many. So we were just asking, have you ever watched the show? Yes or no? If you've not watched the show, it is the end. We don't want to trust someone. So have you watched the show? Yes. How many episodes have you watched? Uh, what did you think about the show? Who was your favorite contestant as a person? How did he, it impact you? What did you learn from the show? What do you think about the women leaders within your county? Did you vote for a woman leader? Yeah. Yeah, so the study employed purposive sampling because one, in the first category, you had m you must have been a top five member from the season one. Two, you must have been a top 50 member to also look at the at uh, how it impacted you even if you didn't make it to top 10. And then also to ask, have you ever watched it? If you've never watched it, then you can answer the question now. So, okay, you have read that, I've said that. So we also interviewed the creators of the show, Media Focus in Africa. We talked to two of the leaders there. Uh, one is called Harrison Manga, the other one is called Kutuku, uh, who is the direct owner. Then we also talked to Media Dreamcatcher Productions. They are the ones who shoot the production. They are the ones who came with the idea, sold it to Media Focus, who now went to look for the funding. So we also talked to their team, uh, the producer, and asked them why do they think it is important for that.
to, to do the show. So then they also we did a survey on the audience. The data was analyzed qualitatively. Yeah, this is a narrative kind of uh, uh, analysis that I did because I was listening to them and trying to compare this person's story and that person's story and where is the resemblance and putting it into the paper. Yeah. Results. Ms. President gave the contestants higher recognition when they visited participants. Participation gave them confidence to apply for more competitive political positions. Even those who failed to get uh, elected, at least they had, uh, they gave that trial. We had, uh, I think she's a lecturer from Imbu. She vied for senator. I think that one is a confidence that's not easy to get. And so is that Ms. President for so it gave them the confidence to vie for even positions that they never thought of. It catapulted less known aspirants to limelight as the sitting political leaders saw them as a threat. Uh, especially when you look at uh, Rene Mayaka, Umuher, and Nerea Okech, when they were top five, even on social media, it was becoming such a threat. They had been called by the political leaders in their places, that is Garisa, Nyamira, and Homa Bay, and be given positions so that they do not vie for other other higher positions like governor, senator, and women rep. They negotiated, some of them negotiated, like Naumu and Rene negotiated to be nominated. And in fact, they were nominated that even when ODM lost, they still got the seats. And if they had not been in Ms. President's show, they who I'm talking. Kidogo, Kidogo, you're just here. I am appointed something. And so Ms. President's show gave them that. Then uh, uh, also Ms. President Cho has highly and positively influenced women leadership in Kenyan politics. Uh, the Delhi TV show has influenced audience perceptions of women leadership and has led to election of women in leadership positions. Then it has helped with empowering candidates on the gender agenda on leadership. In Busia County, one of the contestants, I think uh, she left at, uh, in season one, she left like number 13, top 13. She has also been CC, and these are positions that are coming because when somebody sees you articulating yourself like, oh, Miss President was county, and you're talking well about your county, then you become an ambassador and automatically they believe that you are able to champion for change within the county. Recommendations, we need more training on leadership for women, trust to empower them to challenge themselves into political leadership. A lot of women are still of going for political leadership because of course we understand the issues of harassment and all that but after these kinds of training where they are taught how to counter violence and terrorism how to counter even um, attacks on themselves and even on their personalities they get that confidence that ah that is just hearsay they can say anything about you but you still buy i think one of the women who is an embodiment of that is like milio diambo also have Shebesh, and these are people who really empower people on the show. I'm forgetting to mention Nadia Abdallah, who was also elected from season one to be the CS of uh, ICT. So a lot of this show has really empowered a lot of women. And when we have got uh, the current and even older generation of women leadership, like Shebesh and Milio Diambo, giving a hand and uh, pushing for these trainings and for the Miss President show, it shows that indeed there is a need because they've come to the show, empowered the girls and even talked on the challenges that they faced and sharing with the girls on that has really helped. And then we need more studies that can be done on the impact of film and TV on leadership today. A lot of times, yes, film and TV affect our romantic life because we watch a lot of what? Romantic dramas. So the question is, what about leadership? from news because news can sometimes be boring. What we, when we create more shows on leadership, how does that affect us? We have seen the way when the Queen died, we went to watch Crown, isn't it? Now when it comes to leadership, what else can we watch to empower our young people, our women, and even, even the older generation on better leadership? Uh, thank you. Please don't ask me that question. Okay, so video calls. So the video calls was a fantastic, fantastic presentation. Let's appreciate Zwipi in a better way. I propose Nana for Factoria. Good. So, um, 
nice school it was study and um you know as from the field of finance and math that's now our, our area of weakness it's our achilles heel because it's uh, the indirect contrast to the team but definitely it's a crucial crucial area of research uh, methodology so let's have some feedback to dr zipi's presentation we have um we have one hand up there who else okay let's have mwinzi go first then maybe someone else will have thoughts how to react to zipi's presentation thank you very much good uh, morning members we have been requested not to ask tough questions i hope uh, mine will be tough in uh, statistical problems of a week said that there is no study that has been done in this uh, reality show and therefore you don't disagree tell us whether such studies have been done elsewhere in the world and uh, what were the results another question i'd like to ask for you to sit leaders who were in the first episode of this show they got into leadership and so many people were in this uh, reality show got got into leadership I like to put it this way so that you count this. Same reason that people take initiative to participate in this show is same reason that statistics leadership that drive to be part of the show is also the drive to be in leadership and therefore it is not the show that forces women to be in leadership it's that relationship or what two values not not one relate to the other so that's how i take it i don't know how you look at it let me answer that um the last question is the leaders they don't know people who have not yet been in any leadership position you must put the leader in one way pushes them to recognize that this if you are given a platform that not you bring the confidence of people that you can bring to what you are given to talk about what do you think will lead you into other positions now when you talk about uh, study we we have but because of that movie americans really watch it and that's how clean got it because a lot of people really believe what they see so uh, little study has been done on this show in particular little study has been done because a lot of the study that what the, the study that has been done is by the sponsors and that is uh, what we call monitoring and evaluation but academic research on the show has not yet been done Just to uh, I just to understand how you went about to choose this topic since training is not the same with the uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yes, the reason why I wrote it as Kenya is because this is a case study and I was since they are all from all the 47 counties 
So if you're a case study that's focusing only on the contestants, and then uh, even the viewers are also different counties. So putting them in one location might, uh, might be lying to myself and even to the study because uh, the survey, we, we did the survey online and the contestants, the ones who make it to the 50 are representatives of every county in this, in Kenya. Thank you. Good. So, um, thank you, Zippy, for your nice, nice presentation. And uh, I want at this juncture to shift gears a bit and go all the way to Belgium. And uh, we're going to listen to Ambassador Professor Bidonge Bene, Kenya's Ambassador to, Be to Belgium, virtually. So, let's have Roger Speaker do that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can we put our hands together for Dr. Zippy Okoth? Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. That has been a wonderful presentation. Can we give her Lila Makofi Anyaye? No, no, no. She's a lady. Let's give her flowers. Eh? Let's mold the flowers. Let's mold the flowers. Remember, she molded the very nice flowers. Let's mold these flowers. Let's mold flowers. Let's mold flowers. A Faustin Mwinzi, please stand next to her. Mold those flowers. Faustin Mwinzi, yay. Mold the flowers. Give Dr. Zippy those flowers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zippy. That was a wonderful. That really has uh, inspired this conversation, even as we continue uh, with this session. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, we said this is a global conference, and uh, the word global, uh, in another forum, we talk about calling it global. Global meaning global and local combined. But here now we are going global all the way to Belgium. But before we go to Belgium, you know, this is a figure, an authority who is larger than life. I have no capacity, I don't want to pretend. I will only call in my boss, uh, our DVC professor, Joshua Bazakas, to come and just give us a brief about this gentleman, this son of the soil, this ICT guru, this gentleman who has changed the world with his uh, great innovations and, uh, you know, all the work that he has been able to do. So Prof. Bazakas will present to us this gentleman and is keenly listening because University, really, we always love him a lot, but I think Prof. Bazakas is better placed to talk about this global figure. Very good, sir. Thanks, Rogers. So, uh, I want to begin by saying that this year university puts it up as the University of Business and Technology. And bef because of that, the conference we have has to be uh, to attract the best in those fields. And that's how uh, uh, Ambassador Ngembele comes in. Now, you do have a profile with a website which you can read, so I'm not going to read it for you. But let me tell a few things about Ambassador Sokotangan remember some time back, probably the youngsters, uh, some of them were really young, we had a minister, a permanent secretary in Kenya, and the ministry um, uh, of information, uh, and that six years changed the decision making framework in terms of information was Professor Zippy Bazaka. In fact, uh, at one point, when we addressed the United Nations at one point, and at one point, one of the fellows who tried to introduce him to a friend was Joel Mugwi, and said, oh, this is the dad of the new United. He was actually embarrassed to hear that, but indeed, when you go to other countries and try to to the internet, it's so slow your content. If you try to call to make a phone call, 
from the U.S. to another country to be so expensive. When we do that, then very so easy because of what happened during that time. So there was a friend, Paul Katz, as the father of technology in Africa, especially with the issue of digital footprint. Perhaps in many other boards, including our own Safaricom, but as a scholar, I'm sure it would want to hear this. As a scholar, he really spent time mentoring the young folks, especially in research. And I'm sure Professor Ibanga Mbembo will be very happy to hear that. In this conference, a number of young scholars are in attendance, and that is his passion to mentor young scholars. And I know, I know some of them are on the board. But I see it as a professor at the University of Nairobi in the uh, entrepreneurship in the uh, faculty there at UC. And so, uh, please take some time, uh, read his profile, uh, because it is inspiring, especially to our young scholars. And uh, for me as a person, just for full disclosure, I also wanted to say that my siblings. I want to take this time to welcome Professor Ibanga Mbembo. Prof will request you to unmute yourself. Yes, Prof, now we can hear you. We can hear you. Go ahead.
this is this is this is this is this is for applications that can help us.
doing makofi ya nyayo, right? You want to do makofi ya nyayo? Thank you very much. We want to appreciate Prof, and uh, we want to give you Makofi Anyayo. So, uh, guys, together, let's go. I know our crew maybe will be able to um, show uh, part of the audience so that Prof can be able to appreciate. Okay, three. Tena. Tena. Tunakuheshimu. Tunakupenda. Asante sana. Tunga. Tungua. Thank you very much, Prof. We, that is not political, it is scholarly, and we are doing it in the spirit of uh, the session and the conference that we are having today. Um, I want, for the sake of Prof, just to give, if there is one or two questions, because we are having the young scholars here in the process of uh, the remarks and the presentation that Prof has made, I will allow one or two questions that Prof can respond to before we take a break so that we resume for the afternoon session. So just one question. Maybe if there is one question that comes to mind as we get started, the question of the, from the audience. Um, anyone can unmute themselves about one. Is there any from young scholars? Maybe could you stand up and show us your slide?
political and economic dialogue between general IT skills and various IT specialization skill variables. And we use this data as a light of the digital cost of the data was from the IT graduates themselves. We computed either their bachelor or master's degree. And we were either employed or not. And uh, the data helps us also to sustain computational factors like the questions we did and completed, the description, the reality of a graduate of IT graduates in Congo. This is the procedure we use for uh, realizing our project. We started by collecting data. We the process the data. After processing it, we focus now on the first activity, which was the factor, the computational factor, factors, and for that we use the experience qualified analysis. After that, we extracted the required factors to now build our predictive model in the second phase. And as I said, the starting model is built with uh, different single models. We built first five single deep learning models, which were, which were the multi-layer perception, and we called them MS. MLP1, MLP2, MLP3, up to MLP5, which is the But uh, thankfully, Dr. Mwende is here. Please uh, go over in that one. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. For the first objective, the result was we obtained five different factors after performing the, the exploratory fact analysis. We have a sociopolitical factor, relationship between the graduates and employers factor, strategic factor, academic factor, current financial stability factor. And we retain three factors as independence because of their value of a Thornback Alpha test, which were higher, and the two as a moderating variable. And parent financial stability and the strategic factors were retained at, as moderating variable. And uh, add, as we had the 43 items after our exploratory fact analysis, we come up only with uh, 14 items or variables which were related to those five retained factors. And you can see those variables in uh, each component of the retained factor. The result for the objective two, it was to build a prescriptive, prescriptive or predictive model using the obtained factors as features 
can be seen here. You can see those are the five single multilayer perceptron models we built. And now the last one is our stacking model, which uh, gave a higher performance regarding the recall, regarding the pre precision, F score, accuracy. All those single models perform less than uh, the stacking models. And even you can see from the rock curve, the stacking model performed also better than all the five single multilayer perceptron models. As conclusions, we can say that the results of our research suggest that the contextual factors that predict employability of IT targets in the Congo are five, and three of them are strongly influencing employability. And those three are sociopolitical, academic, and relationship. While two among them are moderately influencing the employability, and those two are strategic factors, and uh, the parent financial stability, which are the two moderate factors we retain. So, to contribute to the debate of SDG target 8.6 achievement, this study was able to capture contextual factors that objectively predict the employability of information technology graduates in the DRC. And those factors help us to build a deep stacking model to predict employability. And the performance of the deep stacking model we have obtained will allow us to generalize the model for application in countries similar to the DRC. The limitation, we had uh, two limitations for this study. The first one was the lack of secondary data that can uh, effectively be used to depict the real problem of employability in unstable developing countries. Uh, so the researchers relied only on the primary data by using uh, conducting a, a survey study. The second limitation was the difficulty to reach a large number of respondents owing to low reachability and high non-response rates among IT graduates in the DRC. Consequently, we adopted small snowball technique, though the study was a quantitative, we used quantitative method, but uh, due to this second limitation, we use only snowball as a sampling technique to gather data from the participants. The contributions, this research provides factors that reflect, reflect the reality that predicts employability in unstable developing countries. This will allow such countries to be more sensitive to those internal factors and also to be realistic when uh, they are implementing some solutions to mitigate employment, unemployment problems in those countries. And also by integrating both skills and sociopolitical and economic factors as predictors of employability of such graduates, this study enriches also the knowledge in the field of employability prediction in a theoretical manner. Practically, this research has built a framework of re reliable and contextual factors that allow predicting objectively and uh, relevantly the employability of IT graduates in unstable developing countries. As a recommendation for future research, the results of this study contribute, constitute our first step for our PhD journey, which uh, is focused on the building of a bet-based recommender system to prescribe suitable employability profiles to Congolese information technology students by taking in, into account the obtained factors as features. Also in the future, we suggest to improve the results of the specific objective one 
by excluding all the factors which will have a lower Cronbach alpha value than 0 0.6, because we have retained two, which we, we consider as uh, moderating, but uh, in the future, we propose to ex exclude them. And the last uh, recommendation is that future studies should also use other coefficients which are more appropriate to non-scaled questions. Because our questionnaire had the non-scaled questions that were even the Cronbach alpha for the test of reliability of our questionnaire was less than 0 0.6. And we propose to use other coefficients like McDonald omega for that purpose. This is uh, some uh, references we used for our paper. And uh, thank you for uh, listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Louis Bernard Kennedy, for a great way. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I now agree to give up my time to What can we do that uh, the level that we have is sufficient so that uh, we avoid this situation? And uh, uh, how many of us were there in the, in the office during all the effort to put planning? And uh, put planning, which is much good, and to keep us already informed about our health plan methods and the quality of uh, performing this Can I answer or uh, you have other questions or I could answer straight? Yes, sir, I can. Yes, sir. Oh, there's another one, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I can start. I can start by the. Hello. Hello. I can hear you. Continue. Hello. Continue, please. You can hear. Continue, please. Okay. I can start by the second question about the statistic of the results we obtained. Mm. About the statistic we obtained. We use snowball because, first of all, the population is not reachable. That's why we use the snowball. And uh, to be sure that uh, there is a kind of representativity, we 
simple by using also the strata technique. As I said, we use the, the four different Congolese linguistic zone, the Congo zone, Lingala zone, Kiswahili zone, and Tuluba zone, which uh, help us also to be sure that all the, the participants are inclusive. That's why we use also the strata level. We didn't only rely on the snowball because of that uh, problem of general, generalizability. And then uh, we tried also to use the strata as technique. And uh, about the analysis and the significant significance of uh, the obtained factors, after performing the exploratory factor analysis, we, we computed Cronbach alpha test for each of those five factors. And now the results of the Cronbach test of each factor, which help us to say that this factor is relevant, this one is not relevant. We remove even others because of that, remain only with five. And even with the five one, the two strategic and uh, the parental financial stability were retained as moderating because of the uh, value of uh, alpha test. So for the first question about uh, deep learning, yeah, deep learning requests a lot of data. It's a huge problem because uh, we had only 421 records, but we used also techniques like uh, generative alternative uh, networking, which help us to generate new data mm -hmm. from our sample of VR. So it is a technique in deep learning, we can generate new data from what, what we have in order to increase the size of the data set. And uh, uh, for the, the deep learning model, the architecture, I have said we built five different multi-layer multi perception. The first one has uh, had four different layers. The second one had three layers. The third one had, had also four layers. The fourth one had uh, uh, five layers. The last one had four layers. Uh, starting model by uh, considering four models five, no, four of those five models as base learner or base learners. And the last single multilayer perception was considered as a meta learner. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your feedback. So we are talking now about deep learning. I will invite you guys to uh, either get a lucky card or share one of these cards freely. So let's be talking about deep learning. So deep learning, uh, we can talk about polarism, Cartesian, Schwer, Arrhenius hypothesis, uh, Corona, Kelvin, Lindemann, Maxwell, variation of polarism, Eureka, Cartesian, and we have Newton, who has this uh, uh, interesting theory or analysis about this polarism. So now we're talking about degrees of polarism and also about polarism. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We have come to the end of uh, our first session, morning session, and we want to proceed for uh, lunch. Before we do that, a very quick announcement that uh, most of uh, all participants here, whether presenters, participants of both kinds of art, live or education work, participate to the morning class so that we, as the morning session, may be easier able to stay within this short period. Um, secondly, um, make sure that you uh, please register. We want to assume that all of you please register in the details uh, with our registration box for purposes of facilitation and not only as the professional when it comes to the need to actually show up here. So the second announcement is that our red team uh, station uh, is really working hard to do so either to your right or to your left. We have red teams there, the teams on the right, the ladies on the left, and towards the next building of 
definition of medium in the financial terms of our education and and the state of the art. That is uh, right how we need to write how you must reduce that. You can optimize or individualize the life cycle of the children. That is a very important uh, uh, differentiation. So please make sure if you need Wi-Fi access, register your details. There's a Wi-Fi credential form. Fill it, then your credentials will be encrypted and you will be given uh, the Wi-Fi password for your utilization in your procedure with your students. Finally, we uh, appreciate the presentations that have gone on and because we have seven presentations soon after lunch, we now must uh, manage our afternoon time well. It was good in the morning, we were still giving our presenters time to flex and you know we were having our guests uh, engaging. So the afternoon presenters, you have strictly 15 minutes to do your presentation and we will field a question or two and that is going to be managed uh, from his upper side. So we want to request our presenters kindly uh, try to not water down the quality but also be able to observe time so that we can go to clear our business order of business for the day. Ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end. We are breaking for lunch quickly, 15 minutes. It is 15 minutes after 1. By 2 p.m. we should be done with our lunch. We find our way back uh, to this room. Otherwise, shall we all be upstanding? Dr. Sporta, kindly bless our meals. We are going for the swallowship program, and so Dr. Sporta, kindly just do a prayer so that we can head straight. Lunch will be served. Um, there is uh, Victoria will guide us. There is uh, you know, the restaurant behind this building, so we will go straight. Emily and Victoria will be able to guide us for lunch. Dr. Sporta, over to you. Thank you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come unto you this afternoon. We thank you for this opportunity you have given us, Father. As we are going to share our lunch together, Father, let that lunch be a blessing to all of us. We pray this prayer believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Guys, let's get going because we don't have much time. We can network over lunch so that by 2 p.m. we are back for the on the floor. So good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Sebastian Kaweto. I'm a PhD student at uh, the University of Nairobi. And uh, I'm privileged to in front of you to present uh, a topic on uh, European option pricing based on uh, regime switching models. And I'm presenting this work together with my supervisors Professor Mwaniki Vivi and uh, Professor Richard Simwa. Yeah, previously in the world of uh, stock exchange, a lot of research has been done on uh, modeling uh, the financial data and more so on uh, modeling the stock return volatility. And you find that uh, Stock return volatility plays a key role in uh, 
option pricing. So it is a, it's a key uh, parameter when it comes to pricing of the options. And therefore, you find that we have realized that uh, uh, the famous Blackshaw model has been applied in uh, pricing the options. But now, the now the stock, sorry, the kind of uh, stock data that we have, it has been uh, noted or observed to exhibit uh, what we call the structural changes, or rather the regime shifts. You find like uh, if it is volatility, there are situations or there are times whereby the volatility is low, and other times it is uh, it is high or it is lower and high. So it changes between those two uh, for a case of two regimes. So you find that our model or the model that has been uh, in existence, the Black Scholes model, has not been able to capture these uh, regime switching, uh, the uh, regime switches in the data, and more so in terms of uh, uh, modeling the volatility, which is measured by the the variance of the data. Next slide. That notwithstanding, we have uh, uh, studied the the work that has been done previously, and especially uh, we have. Uh, Bowens and others 2006 who developed a regime switch in GATCH model. And this model better describes the volatility because it is able to capture the regime sh uh, shifts in the stock data. We have also uh, Liu and others who have also done a lot of research in, the, in that kind of uh, situation whereby the market is exhibiting the re uh, regime shifts. Me and my supervisors, in this work of my PhD, we have been able to develop models that uh, cushion that effect of uh, wanting to model the regime shifts in the data. And uh, in a paper titled, uh, titled European Option Pricing Under Regime Switching Gatch Model, we are able to develop two uh, regime switching models that is a regime switch, that is a model without the gauge. And then we also added another component, the gauge. Because we wanted to see, again, what is the effect of uh, adding gauge in the regime switch model. So this research, or this work I'm presenting today, is just uh, an application of uh, the work that we have done previously, because already it has been published. And uh, we want to apply those two models to uh, and compare them with the the traditional model, which is the black scores model, to see whether these two models we have come up uh, with are going to give us uh, predictions or estimations that are close to the famous black scores uh, model. Then, in our statement of the problem, as I mentioned earlier. We are saying the financial markets exhibit structural changes with the time, and thus the famous Black Shores model for option pricing does not capture the structural changes, the stock uh, returns volatility. Therefore, we need models that uh, can have their parameters change with the regime, uh, with the regime switches, or models that can capture the, the structural changes in the data. Next slide. So the objective. I already mentioned that we want to compare the performance of the regime switching uh, and the, re the regime switching catch model against the, the famous Black Shores model when it comes to pricing of the, the European options. So on methodology, we have uh, next slide. We have uh, we have stated. I've not given the mathematical details of the Black Shores model. But we have stated the model, which is the Black Shores model, which is going to be our, our benchmark model. And then now our two models, the regime switch model and the, the regime switch in gauge model. Next slide. So that is uh, the regime switch, which we came up uh, by looking at uh, work that had been done by Adi. 2001, 
and also Godin and Trotia 2020, that is 2021, and also our work now that was done uh, early this year. So we have uh, the regime switching model. Up. That is uh, the model. And uh, for mathematical details on the derivation of this one, uh, we will refer you to our paper, the one of 2022. That is Sebastian, that is Kalovo and others. And uh, also you can also look at the manuscript that we have submitted. Because it also given us details on how we came to derivation of these two models. We have the regime switching model, the next one. And uh, I've said this model is able to, the two models are able to capture the regime swift, uh, switches in the, in the stock data. So the next bit, we have done the analysis of the data. Next. Yeah, we have done results at the discussion. And uh, the data that we have used, we have used uh, the Russell's 2000 uh, index and also the Facebook index. These ones we chose on the availability. And it's for the period ranging between June 2012 to June 2020 to June 2022. We have also looked at uh, the call options, explain. We have looked at uh, the call options expiring uh, in 15 days, 70 days, 135, and 250 days, cutting across what we are calling the short data data and long data data to see whether there is going to be variation when it comes now to, uh, to predicting the options, the European options. So we have a table down there where we first did the preliminary analysis of looking at the basic statistics for the two indices. And we did find that uh, the data from those uh, uh, two indices is, uh, normally, is not normally distributed. Since the skewness and the excess satosis are different from that of uh, normal distribution of 0 and 3. So those are some of the uh, basic statistics. We have also, to confirm that our data is not uh, normally stated, we have also done the uh, empirical uh, plots as as the normal densities. And you can see that uh, the normal density uh, is different because the empirical densities are half sharp peaks. So that's a, a clear and a confirmation that uh, the data we have in is not uh, normally distributed. Then we have, uh, we have also done, uh, we have also done the plots for the, the returns. We have also done the, that is the, we have, we did first, we did first uh, the plot of uh, the adjusted closing prices against the, against time. And also we did now the plot for the returns for the first set of data. We can see that uh, the, there are fluctuations of, the, of the, the stock market. Or rather, the data shows that there is some trade, and also it is stochastic, it's not deterministic. Now, we also have, vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, we also have the, the returns for the two models. And you can see that they have the famous, they have the, that is the, the, the expected features, the stylist, stylistic facts that uh, uh, are expected for stock returns data. We have tried to fit the model so that now we can have our, our models being fit, the regime switch and the regime switch catch. We first did the parameter estimates because we are going to use them in fitting our model to come up with our, our options. And those are the values that we, come, we came up, up with. The mu one and mu2. Mu1 is the mean in the first regime. Mu2 is the mean in the second regime. These are fees. Or similarly, sigma1 is the volatility in the regime 1. Sigma2 is the uh, volatility in the 
second, uh, in the second regime. In our case, the first regime is the low volatility regime. And the second regime is high volatility regime. So you find that in the second regime, in both markets, the mean is negative, mean that uh, these returns have earned uh, negative returns. You also have uh, P12, that is the, probability, the transition probabilities from uh, first uh, state to the second state. Like for Russell, the probability for, uh, from the first state is 0 0.05608. Then we have uh, the probability of moving now. Once the, that process is in the, second re in the first regime, uh, in the second regime, what is the probability now of falling back? We also have it 0 0.01167. We also have the, the same estimations or parameter estimates for the RIS gauge, that is the regime switch gauge. And this one we used to fit our, our, day, our models. So we were able to, and you can see that uh, the BS model for the two categories of data has the least uh, value, being that it is the better model compared to our two models. Then in conclusion, we are saying that the three models report values that are not significantly different. Uh, however, the root mean square uh, error results show that the BS model outperforms the, the two models for both short dated and long dated historical data. And therefore, we can say in general that the regime, switch, uh, the regime switch and the regime switch gauge models give similar predictions for the European options uh, to that given by the BS model. However, we recommend further research to fit these three models with the different data sets to confirm if the findings will be consistent with ours. Then, those are some of the references. And then, thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. So let's give a round of applause for Sebastian. So we are going to have uh, some few questions for Sebastian. So if you have any any question, okay, let's go. Thank you, thank you very much, Sebastian, for a very good presentation. Uh, this has reminded me uh, so much. Now, I have a few clarifications that maybe you may wish to make to me on the same. One, all through you talked about the Black Scores evaluation model, and uh, you were only referring to the call uh, evaluation, the, the, call, the, the, the the black scores valuation model for the call option. Uh, all throughout, you talked about the call option prices, and I thought you could also bring in on board the put option prices uh, or indices, because you know that uh, at one point they pull in different direction. The other question or clarification that you may give us, you. Uh, in the data, you were selecting the 15 days, 35 days, 70 days. I, I wish to know what was the basis of you considering this interval. The other element is um, you considered the black uh, scores valuation model, but we also know that there is binomial, uh, a binomial option model and whether you took into account of that and maybe why you had to do away with it and instead talk about the three. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spotter. Any other question from our delegate? So maybe I can ask also a question. In my understanding, there we use switching models eh? if there is aberrance in observations or outliers. So I, I really didn't get the choice of the switching model in this data set. 
Maybe you can clarify that. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. I'll respond uh, starting from the last. You have said that uh, you don't understand the choice for the our models for the regime switch, owing to the fact that uh, it's all to be done uh, on the, where we have outliers. And I would say it's not only when there is uh, outliers. Our, I did mention from the beginning that uh, the stock market data or the financial data uh, has been observed to exhibit these structural changes, and especially uh, in terms of the, 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 the variance, which is the, the constant. So you find that, uh, because we are calling this one volatility, uh, every time uh, you'll find that there will be a period of uh, low of volatility, then it alternates with another period of high volatility. So you find that when it comes to BS, uh, the Black Scholes model, this model is not considering that uh, change in volatility, because it's giving you the constant. But you see in our model, we are able to, uh, to combine the effect of uh, the volatility being the low regime and also being in the, in the high regime. So we are able to have a better uh, prediction in terms of uh, modeling the volatility. So our choice of uh, the regime switching model was uh, based on that. I don't know whether I've answered it. Then uh, there was another concern on uh, why we are, why I've consistently talked of uh, the call option. We, for, this, uh, for the purpose of this, uh, this uh, presentation, we chose the call option, not because uh, our models cannot fit the, the put option. Actually, we have tried the model still using the put option in our, in our main papers, and uh, the results are similar to what we have in the, in the put option. Probably I've forgotten the, the other key question my, my brother had asked you, and you can remind me, please. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the choice of uh, those intervals, it was just a random, depending on the, that time when we were, getting, when we were gathering, gathering this data. We wanted to have uh, data that is appearing for short, uh, for short duration and also long duration. And we felt that what was available for us, for us, uh, for us that time, we, had, uh, we considered 15 days, 70 days to be short dated, and one that five which is uh, slightly different from uh, 70 and uh, 250 days, we took this one to mean long dated uh, historical data. So the choice was just random. There was no <laughs> uh, a clear cut method how we chose the, the data. Then, uh, not that we ignore the binomial, binomial uh, uh, model in the uh, option pricing, but our interest uh, was much on the Black Scholes model, which we think is the famous model uh, among the models that are existing in literature. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. So another round of applause for Sebastian. <laughs> so thank you. We move on to the next presentation, 15 minutes kindly. Uh, Emily Okoth and Dr. Priscilla Kashigi from KCA University. So they are presenting on mental well-being and academic qualifications for students. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Emily Okoth. I'm a PhD student at Daystar University studying clinical psychology. And uh, my co-author is Dr. Priscilla, Dean of Students, School of Education, right there at the back. Uh, 
Uh, you're welcome. This is a research that we've done at KCA University. It's not yet complete, it's still ongoing, but we've, picked, we've already collected data. And so um, our presentation this afternoon is uh, in regards to mental health and academic achievement. So what we were seeking to find out is how mental health affects students' performance. Um, now, there's a lot of research that has been done, not much in Kenya, but generally all over the world. And uh, when we look at mental health, we are looking at the well-being of a person. And when you're looking at the well-being of a person, it simply means how much is this person thriving despite the stresses that they may have? What is it that may affect them such that they're not able to perform to their peak? So mental health in universities, students have consistently increased. You realize that going on, and therefore mental health, because of various issues that happen in and around the students, they, that does affect both at home and at school. And so there is so much research that has been done. Uh, for example, um, Einstein at et al. 2017 uh, posits that mental health issues in university students have consistently increased over time. And then we look at the Tino's 1975 theory of student departure. It posits that college students' retention is a complex interaction between social and academic interaction. So social, mostly, and also academic pressures of education and all that does bring a lot of mental health issues and may affect or does affect um, uh, student performance. Thank you. So uh, the background is um, our focus really is on student mental health. How is it that we can incre increase um, the mental health so that it does not impact on their academic performance? And then we look at the mitigation of the causes of mental health and then promote awareness about mental health challenges. So all these contribute to the challenges of mental health that does affect the students and thereby um, impact the academic achievement. Now, studies um, have been done, and uh, we are looking at uh, some of the things that may have contribute, co contributed to these challenges. And when we're looking at this, we want to specifically look at the first year students. Um, the prime time to promote awareness about mental health challenges is during one's first year in college so that students can be prepared and adopt as issues occur. So studies have been done in Canada and US, and specifically in Kenya, uh, we are told that 14 to 30 percent of adolescent students joining university are assumed to have psychosocial health problems which affect their academic performance. So um, the problem statement is most students transitioning from secondary school to the university experience an array of difficulties adjusting to the new social environment. So that has been determined by the study that we've done. And so when we look at um, the testing tools that we've used, the key one is generalized anxiety disorder and the patient health disorder. GAD7 and PHQ9. So we were able to share the questionnaires, self-formulated questionnaires with the students, which they were able to fill and they determined whether or not the students' academic performance were affected by their mental health related issues. So against this backdrop, the purpose of the study was to assess the effect of mental well-being on academic achievement among the KCA university students. Now, the main objective I've already mentioned, we looked at the variables. The, the outstanding variable is uh, academic achievement. 
and the dependent variables is anxiety, panic, and depression. We looked at two theories, the social learning theory and the cognitive behavioral theory. So the social learning theory basically looks at how does a student learn socially, what are some of the things that come into play, for example, observation, attention, retention, reproduction, and motivation. And as it were, many mental health issues does affect all those variables. So those are the things that come in when you look at the social learning theory. And then we looked at the cognitive behavioral theory. How a student thinks, feels, and behaves. So that does also explain how we arrived at that. The study design, uh, the one we adopted was the descriptive survey design because we needed to describe exactly how mental health affects uh, the student's academic performance. And uh, the descriptive design was deemed preferable as it enables the researcher, researcher to investigate issues as they occur, devoid of variable manipulation. Yeah, so the study area was KCA University. We looked at the student population, and then we looked at the first year population, which was a total of 3,750. And out of that, our study population was 1,855. I'll show you how we arrived at that. So the formula we used was the Yamen formula, 1967. And it explains how that was arrived at. That is how we brought the, we got the sample that we used, which was 95. So the, this formula gives a sample of 95 first, first year students who are randomly sampled from the sampling frame. So that's the, pro, the, that's the technique we use, the formula we use to arrive at the 95 students. The data analysis was done both through the descriptive and infer inferential statistics. Um, and that's the formula that was used. We looked at the academic achievement and we looked at the variables, as Anya explained, anxiety, panic, and depression. That, those were our results. Under the descriptive statistics, we looked at the anxiety, the variables of anxiety, depression, and academic achievement. And the composite mean for all, well, for anxiety was 4.184, with a standard deviation of 0 0.5 which is quite significant, and uh, depression 3.97 at uh, standard deviation of 0 0.4, and academic achievement at 3.8, standard deviation of 0 0.4 to 6. So the findings imply that a majority of the respondents highly affirm to experiencing anxiety and depression in the preceding two weeks. The findings also imply that a majority of the respondents report moderately high academic achievement at 3.813. We looked at the correlational, correlation analysis, and when you look at that, um, the achievement in terms of, the achievement is at uh, one for achievement, anxiety 0.481, depression 0.529, all significant. Anxiety is at 4.481, and uh, depression 0.524. So when we um, analyze that, we can say that the study recorded a medium, positive, and significant correlation between anxiety and academic achievement, and a strong positive and significant correlation between depression and academic achievement. That's the regression analysis again. It shows the significance of the study. So the findings are that A is 0 0.580 correlation value was observed from the output in table three, modeling a strong linear linkage between anxiety and depression and academic achievement. 
and R2 value of 0 0.337 was also observed, implying that anxiety and depression jointly account for 33% of academic achievement, and the balance of 66.3 ascribed by other factors, which the regression model in this research, research did not include. So those, those are the ones we're still working on. So outcomes of the ANOVA test as per the depiction in Table 6 shows that the regression model adopted in the study was significant at um, 0 0.05. The regression coefficient of 0.281 in anxiety means that for every 1% increase in anxiety, there is a correlated 0.281% increase in academic achievement, controlling for the other variables. Meanwhile, for every 1% increase in depression, there is a 0.382 increase in academic achievement, controlling for the other variables. So our conclusion was that a majority of first-year students at KCA University have moderately high levels of undiagnosed anxiety and depression. A majority are easily stressed, worried, and depressed which causes poor academic performance. There is a statistically significant relationship between anxiety and academic achievement among first-year students at KCA University. There is a statistically significant relationship between depression and academic achievement among first-year students at KCA University. So our, recommenda our recommendations were that the study recommends periodic psychological assessment and evaluation, being able to find a way of periodically examining our students and uh, ensuring that they're psychologically stable. The second one is social integration programs, whereby for first-year students, we're able to integrate them into products that, into programs that can help them improve their mental uh, well-being. And then lastly is to promote education and awareness information about mental health resources to stigmatize, uh, to, de -stigma, to reduce stigma. Usually there's a lot of stigma around mental health and counseling. And therefore, our recommendation that, that a lot of awareness should be created so that um, our students can be aware of how they can seek help in case of mental health. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Emily. Thank you very much. Um, let's have feedback. Emily's presentation, please. Any questions? Dr. Nanjala has a question. Alex, there's a mic. So yes, I want to ask a question. Maybe I don't understand. Can someone have depression without anxiety? So I'm, I'm thinking anxiety confounds depression. So they're not independent. So I don't know. So that we, we don't have the two as independent variables in the same regression. So that can help they're us understand. They're trying to avoid multicollinearity. Exactly. You can have depression without having anxiety. Because um, sometimes the symptoms of depression are not similar to those of anxiety. Anxiety, for example, you can be anxious and not depressed. And sometimes we're even told that you need some a bit of anxiety for you to be able to move on. But when you're depressed, you can move on. You're you stop liking the things you want, you liked before, you stop you know, doing the things you used to like, you become sad, emotional, and all that. You can be anxious without being emotional. For example, um, maybe as I was coming for the presentation, I may have had anxiety, but that, that, that does not mean that I could also be having depression. So the two are actually not, uh, not similar, I could say so. No. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. If you're depressed, you don't have to be anxious. You can be depressed, you're sad, 
you you're not doing things the way you do you emotional and all that but it does you don't have to exhibit signs of anxiety not not at all it could be there but not necessarily so according to the art and science of counseling those two are independent of each other right they're independent of each other good so thank you thank you for that question oh Thank you so much, uh, Emily. I don't know where I will get the right words to put what, what I want to say. But I started by asking, for how long was this study done? Number two, was this study an experiment or just a normal study and then uh, we have, we have the right life-threatening uh, findings? As a parent, I'm scared, and and I'm 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 at pains to to choose the right words. Is there a psychological tool that can test the mental well-being or healthiness of somebody, other than the basic questions of Fasia who are only barely five weeks old in the university, and 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 we are making such such conclusions about our students. Why am I, am I heading here? There, there's a lot of, uh, and, and this is important as researchers, despite the ability to carry out, uh, to apply the normal research methodological tools and bring out findings and conclusions, but there is an ethical aspect to what we do. And, 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 and I don't know. Because when you say, one of the findings is like you're saying, oh, our students are stressed. Is this unique in case you know, it, for me I'm saying is if, if this study was done like five years in, and, and, and in different places, then I'll be very happy with the findings. But I'm looking at first years, academic achievement. For how long and on what? Two, if this work was to be published, what will it say about our university? I say this as a staff and as a, as a parent. I'm a worried man. Thank you. Okay. Let uh, Emily respond to that. Go ahead, Emily. Thank you, and thank you for your question. Um, yes. The survey was done two months ago, and it's not for the current uh, first year students, for the, for the ones who came in in January. Secondly, uh, we have a counseling unit, and there are uh, issues that arise in terms of uh, depression, uh, anxiety, and many other mental health related issues that we may not have put here, suicidal ideation and all that. So. Our, what informed the study was the fact that we would like to arrest this. As we said earlier, when you have a first year, it's easier for us to help them transition so that, uh, because when they come into campus, there are many issues that come about. They're going to meet other people who have been there and there's so much that is happening. What is there for sure that there's a lot of depression? And depression is not only because of uh, academic issues, but uh, the academics are affected because of many other re issues that may, you know, be affecting them. We look at relationships, we look at parent parents. I, I, I heard you say that you are a parent. There are many students, they could, they're here. They could be, there are many of them who really have issues with their parents and that is affecting their mental health, such that by the time they come to school, they're not able to concentrate because of the mental effects that they get because of those kind of relationships. So yes, it's important that we do this because we would like to also have those recommendations put in place so that we can be able to support the students as they transition into campus. Now you asked about the tools that we use. Over there we have the GD GAD, 
generalized anxiety disorder. That's a tool that we use. Then there's the patient health questionnaire. And in those questionnaires, as I said earlier, we use the descriptive um, uh, survey. And the questions that were asked were able to help us to determine the level of depression, the level of anxiety that students have and how it affects their academic achievement. I don't know whether I answered. Uh, and then you asked about what will be said about KCA University. The truth is there's a lot of depression and issues to do with substance abuse, indiscipline, and all that that is affecting all students across the universities. And for us as KCA, we'd like to find a way of supporting these students. And it's only through the surveys that we're able to really determine what exactly they need so that we can be able to support them in that regard. So for this particular survey, it's to support us in the counseling um, division within the university so that we can be able to support our students better. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Emily, for the question. Uh, I'll, I'll go to the statistics. Huh? Uh, you started by mentioning that your target population was, uh, I've forgotten the figure, but it was around 1,800 and something. Yeah, something like that. Huh? So, um, was it a specific cohort in KCA University, or which group of first years is that? Currently, I think we, we have more than 3,000 first years who are in their first semester. So maybe it would be better if you clarify which point in time you are considering, and you also try and justify why that point in time, and not a series of points in time that have that kind of uh, characteristic. Then you mentioned that you are, according to some formula, the, the, the sample size is 95. Uh, sorry to say that my gut feeling tells me that that might be too small. It might be too small, so you may want to rethink about that. Uh, you are mentioning about uh, a use of a regression model. Uh, regression models are good. Actually, almost all the models are regression models, which is a good thing. But when you talk about the Y variable, there are some assumptions that must be true about the Y variable. Uh, you may need to check or clarify whether those assumptions are satisfied before you use the, the ordinary uh, regression model. Thank you. Anthony Mulinge is uh, soon going to be a PhD in applied statistics. And uh, he has given some valuable, valuable feedback to Emily to add value to her work. And I believe Emily has taken notes. Okay, let's have Angelica Gatira Gitonga, PhD candidate at the University of Nairobi, taking us through talent management practices, work flexibility, and electronic human resources management for Generation Z. It's quite a mouthful, right? But uh, I believe every word has got some meaning to it. You're welcome, Ms. Gitonga. As Ms. Gitonga comes in, we want to uh, get feedback. There's some, there's some questionnaires that are going to be distributed, so be gracious enough to fill them for us so that we can be able to get feedback. Thank you. Um, all protocols observed. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Angelica. Gateria Gitonga, um, Sigateria, not Gatera. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Nairobi, but I wear two hats. I'm also a lecturer at KCA. Um, I'm going to take us through um, talent management practices, work flexibility, and electronic human resource management for Gen Z. We all know about Gen Z's. And I think I felt I needed to um, study more about the Gen Z's. Let's go on. Thank
Thank you. Um, of course, we all know every organization's uh, success is um, dependent on the type of staff that that organization has, the quality. That's what we are looking at. And therefore, it is always inevitable for every organization to adopt a strategic um, talent management a practice that attract the right kind of staff. Um, of course, there is information um, in the in literature about talent management uh, uh, practices in organizations, and this alludes to a shift from that traditional way of hiring, uh, training, or development, uh, 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 rewarding, to a modern way of doing things such that an organization is required to adopt abilities that would develop strategies that enhance leveraging on the diverse talents that are portrayed by the different staff. We all know we are of different generations. Even here, we are of different generations. And um, every generation here exhibits uh, various or varied um, work demands or characteristics. And therefore, I was interested in Gen Z, which is the newest entrant into the labor market. Uh, these people were born with uh, digital um, capabilities. They found our mobile phones. They found our laptops. And these people are, are, are quite, they are digital natives. And therefore, the organization has to ensure that they embrace that technology so that we can accommodate these digital uh, natives. The Gen Z's work values. Dr. Joroge talked about um, work life balancing. And this is the one of the values for Gen Z's. They want to work and they also want to balance with their lives. And therefore, this has enabled them to be even more innovative. Um, and of course, the business would find it very essential to have such people so that uh, they can leverage on that capability. Technology, of course, is one of um, a factors of production and also a key pillar in the uh, uh, sustainable development uh, goals. And therefore, research has established that incorporating EHRM, that's why I'm bringing now EHRM so that we can accommodate the Gen Z's um, in uh, uh, working on our practices. These, the HR practices, as we've said, we already are uh, transforming from uh, the traditional way of doing uh, uh, things. And therefore, there is, of course, increased demand for work flexibility or flexible work arrangements and the flexible work arrangements would include the time. I want to report to time when I am available. I want to go to work or even to the workplace when I am able to travel there. I want to go to work uh, when I can organize my work so that I'm able to uh, balance with even non-work demands. Hence, that person uh, environment fit. I think I'll put it off. <laughs> um, so in this study, there is digitized uh, talent. Uh, of course, we are looking at that architecture which is customized, personalized to provide employee-centric HR practices, including flexible work arrangement, and to effectively and efficiently utilize the young generation's potential. It is uh, definitely uh, the duty of the organization to automate their HR practices. 
uh, so that, uh, of course, by use of web technology, uh, so that they're able to support the HR uh, practices. Um, um, the problem of this today was to, the critical concern was that there has been, um, there has not been an accurate understanding of talent management practices for Gen Z. And of course, uh, their demands for flexible work arrangement. Further, there was need to establish if EHRM uh, really support uh, HR practices to enhance work flexibility. Um, the objective of the study uh, was, uh, of course, the broad one was uh, to determine the relationship between uh, talent management practices for Gen Z and work flexibility. And further, the study also sought to determine the mediating effect of EHRM on that relationship between talent management practices for Gen Z and work flexibility. I reviewed uh, three theories uh, in this uh, study, um, generational gap theory, because I needed to understand uh, why uh, generations are classified and why they exhibit different uh, characteristics. Then the theory of work adjustment uh, informed me on the talent management practices that match the skills and competencies of employees with job uh, requirements. The theory of planned behavior informed me on the prediction uh, of, uh, about the employer's intentions to formulate and implement programs that promote the work-life integration and work flexibility. Um, I also looked at uh, each variable because my research or my study had three variables. That is the independent variable, uh, the dependent variable, and also the mediating variable. And the dependent variable is the uh, talent management practices, uh, which included uh, talent planning, talent acquisition, talent learning and uh, development, and uh, then talent um, reward and performance. For work flexibility, uh, again, I was looking at the workplace. Um, the, that amount of work that needs to be, uh, the workload that needs to be performed at a particular time, and yet we want to have that flexible uh, work uh, arrangement. Um, the, sorry, I keep on switching it off. Uh, the EHRM, of course, uh, came in uh, because we need to look at the administrative part of HR, operational, um, uh, also um, relational and transformational uh, focus of HRM. And therefore, EHRM comes in to uh, make the work of HR administrators much easier uh, because of bringing in the technology uh, part of it. Um, I hand, uh, that's the conceptual framework. And of course, this is helping us to understand the relationships between um, the three uh, variables. Um, further, I reviewed uh, uh, s uh, some empirical studies regarding um, this. And uh, on the relationship between the talent management practices and work flexibility, I found that there is, of course, that paradigm shift, um, which is bringing about the new form of uh, talent management architecture. So there is that need, and the paradigm shift is towards um, uh, a simple and authentic response and transparent HR service. That's what people want uh, in these days. Then talent management practice and EHRM, uh, the argument, of course, that uh, are existing in research is that they have been pointing to developing appraising, deploying, and retaining talented employees, uh, which is made easier with EHRM. As I said, uh, technology is what we are going for today. Uh, work flexibility and EHRM, uh, definitely we have seen that uh, EHRM uh, is able to mediate or to enhance uh, work flexibility. Uh, or work uh, or flexible work arrangements in the organization. 
And the three variables um, um, put together uh, is that EHRM supports efficiency, service delivery, standardization, and organization image. Many organizations would uh, develop their image because of views of the EHRM. And therefore, the organizations are embracing flexible employee-centric work environments that allow workers to ultimate freedom uh, regarding when, where, and how they allocate resources to work and also uh, non-work uh, domains. Um, of course, I was able to identify some gaps. And my observation is that um, these studies, many of them were done um, in the European, um, Asian, and also American countries. And I want to bring it home to Kenya when I will be doing my empirical study and see how uh, our organizations are handling the Gen Zs and the EHRM. And also studies done, of course, there is a lot on talent management practices, but um, they are just limited to general HR. And, and therefore, I would want to do an empirical study and C to eight that at least I can zero in on Generation Z uh, so that um, I don't have that general um, uh, research. Then existing literature, of course, also argue that Gen Z were born and brought up with uh, current technology, which I already said. And of course, this cohort has already entered the labor market. We cannot complain about them. We need to embrace them and come up with strategies that are going to help them work and work well. Um, um, the conclusion of it is that, um, of course, research has posited that uh, currently um, talent management has gotten into a new era, as we said, and therefore um, there is need to shift from that tradition of functions. Uh, also, strategic uh, talent management uh, practices promote work flexibility and initiatives as organizations aim to meeting the demands and expectations of their young, uh, talented uh, employees, or Gen Z in particular. And there is, of course, that digital transformation that uh, is revolution revolutionizing how organizations identify their clients and carry out their operations, conceive business models, and organize themselves by integrating digital technologies. I think we have been talking about uh, digital technologies so much. There is a lot of social uh, media, mobile, analytics, cloud, and, and, and in the service to transform business work environment. Um, my recommendations um, uh, for policy, um, it is always, um, I would say that uh, because research has uh, supported this, that um, currently talent management has gotten into a new era and therefore it is the organizations that need to change and, uh, and uh, come up with the policies that support uh, a digital uh, management of their employees. Um, more research needs to be carried out so that uh, we are able to see, even with the break uh, of um, um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, that has forced, um, I, I, I can see even the organizations to social distance. Um, there is a lot of demand for uh, flexible work arrangements and therefore um, there is need to research on that. On the, regarding the economy, it calls for an organization to take action in understanding Gen Z and concentrate on what ticks them. We cannot call them, but what ticks them, so that we are able to develop them and support them for the success of uh, a sustainable growth of the organization and the economy at large. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, that was a delica at the area. Let's clap for Ms. Gateria. Um, she's a budding scholar and one of us here at KCA University. Okay, so let's have um, Nicholas, you have a question? Okay, that was such a fabulous presentation. No one is courageous enough to ask a question about it. Okay, good. 
Let's have Lucy Krem, oh, sorry, Ame Vundi, African Nazarene University, doing a presentation on the effects of work from home strategy on employee performance during COVID-19. Ame Vundi. Don't get impatient. Ame is the so last presenter for the day. We are almost uh, going to take Four o'clock tea. After me, we are going to have Benson Gobi, and then uh, we'll call. We'll call it a day. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Amy Vundi, uh, PhD candidate at uh, Nazarene University. I'm here with my supervisor, Dr. Lucy Kirima, to support me, and. Uh, we worked on a paper, and I know it's a paper that we are going to develop as we continue because of the kind of issue that we are approaching. Okay, thank you. So this is a paper that I know we will be developing as time goes on because uh, some of the effects that we are going to be looking at or what we are looking at is something that as universities we have embraced and I know it's going to be a long-term uh, kind of a solution that is going to be embraced by most universities. Uh, so our topic is effects of work from home strategy on employee performance during the COVID-19 pandemic and we did a case study of the private universities and selected a few that uh, gave us or informed us and we were able to you know uh, generalize the findings that we got and just to introduce this topic when in march uh, the first case was announced you know in kenya a few things changed as time went by and the first thing that happened is uh, we had the lockdown, and everybody from nursery school, Ishui, up to the university and churches, everything closed down, and we went on lockdown. But there are things that we could not stop. Where I work, we continued. You know, it was almost like a flip of a button, and things have changed. But you need to continue for sustainability, you know, for continuity, for growth, and all that. And and uh, and uh, that informed the study. Just looking at yes, there is a closure, and we have to close. Uh, eight 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 percent of the people or the businesses went virtual. You know, as uh, as I was listening to Angelica, I was just relating to my issues, and I was thinking, yes, we needed to be flexible. We needed to adopt, and you know, as managers and strategic managers, what we do is. Uh, we align our institutions to the changing environment, and as things change, uh, we need to change so that we remain relevant as time goes on. Um, so what we were supposed to solve or the solution or the gap that we were looking at is to ensure that the inequalities that were going to be experienced by us moving from the classroom, from the offices, to at home, on the WhatsApp groups, on the Google Drive meetings, on the Zoom uh, classes and all that, for us to ensure that the economical inequalities, the geographical inequalities do not affect uh, the way employees worked and the delivery of the services. What were the things that we had to look at? And one of the, uh, some of the objectives or some of the areas we were looking at was self-leadership or just being able to intrinsic in, uh, from just inwardly uh, coming up with a program of your own as an employee and ensuring that you will get up at eight and uh, you know start operations as you would have done if you were physically in your office and that is one of the objectives the other one that we were looking at was a technological adoption of course you being virtually or digitally you know, all over, you are, sup you are supposed to be able to communicate, you are supposed to be able to teach, you are supposed to be able to give that support uh, system. How are you supposed to do that unless the, uh, the technology was enabling you? 
So communication also came in very handy because what we realized was it uh, bottom up, top, uh, bottom. We needed that communication and a clear communication from all ends uh, to ensure that the people were aware what they were supposed to do, when they were supposed to do with minimal supervision. Because at some point we realized that employees uh, it was a shocker, but they needed to adopt this new approach. How were the employees uh, motivated or satisfied uh, during this process? You know, it's not everybody will be willing or who will be able to handle the change. We know we say change, change brings a lot of uh, things out whenever it happens. So how many people are going to be able to adopt to such changes and really perform and be satisfied and not um, end up being so stressed? Uh, we've, we've listened to the uh, presentation on the mental well-being. It came up a lot, the mental well-being of employees and what um, happened to their satisfaction. Was it going uh, to be brought about by just being assured that there was... Um, Salary at the end of the day, was it uh, going to be on the basis that people will uh, just appreciate you and say thank you and all that kind of new theories here and there. And we were able to just come up with a few, uh, out, uh, a few findings. So the research methodology, uh, we use qualitative, majorly at the very beginning because we, we wanted to understand the emotions, you know, of the whole process and quantitative came in at the end. Uh, we have 32 private universities in the country, and we chose four because of just the convenience. Uh, again, remember during 2020 up to some point this year, we've emphasized mostly on virtual kind of meetings. So we use the electronic questionnaires, and we send these mostly to the lecturers, administrative staff, and heads of departments to just understand how has w uh, working from home affected the performance of these employees? Have we been able to admit students properly? You know, have we been able to have enticing classes? You know, have we been able to do exams which are eligible or uh, something that could have been used to measure that uh, at least you've been learning? Uh, we did a, a pilot study in one of the universities and we were able to continue, do a descriptive uh, statistics uh, just to analyze the information that we got and use the SPSS to finally analyze using the few qu qu quantitative data that we were using. Uh, the findings were very simple. It is that a sense of uh, balance in life was required, okay? Uh, this came up because as we were doing our research, we noticed there was a difference in gender in the kind of response that we got. Uh, females found it a bit off, you know. Uh, the, the, there was the balance between taking care of your people at home and uh, doing your office work because you were working in the house, okay? Uh, so most females found it a bit hard to concentrate on the office work, but the males uh, did very well and actually performed exemplary. Uh, that's one finding that we found. Then technology-wise, there was a lot of training. There was a lot of enabling uh, systems that were brought in, and also social media was adopted. Uh, communication was done very clearly from the management to the people down as, uh, uh, as, as things were happening. Uh, a few universities were not able to, to satisfy you know, uh, their, their, their employees, maybe just because they said we'll receive a pay cut, you know, that's the assumption, but that is what we found out. Uh, finally, the employees uh, were, were not, okay, the vari there was a variance when it came to, it came to uh, employee satisfaction or motivation uh, during that time when people were working from home. There were a few trends that we were able to uh, 
find as you were just working through the work at home. And some of them, I think, given the keynote speaker talked about and uh, Professor Dikange, when you're looking at widening uh, skills gap, when you're looking at resource scarcity and climate change, those are things that Professor Dikange talked about. Uh, changing nature of career where we are having graduates and, uh, you know, they are not more to meet in the market. And things have changed. Now that we have gone that uh, in the, you know, work from home, we have gone to the digital or hybrid uh, kind of approach, then it means the careers are also going to be changed. As universities, have we changed with, uh, you know, with that kind of a demand? and all that. There are many mobility, we have globalization. Today, uh, today I know most universities are housing uh, international students just because we went digital, we worked from home. So there are people who benefited, and I think the private universities benefited more. If we become more innovative and embrace, of course, um, the you know innovations that have come up from such a problem, then we'll be able to be sustainable and grow. So to conclude is that it's very clear. If uh, the environment is uh, favorable, both the students and the staff will be able to adopt to online learning, home, uh, working from home, or what we call the hybrid mode, uh, you know, from the normal call it the new normal, there is no more normal. We are calling it new normal where we learn and teach virtually uh, and we are able to really embrace what is happening or what we are coming. What are we contributing, you know, what are we contributing? This study is going to contribute in many areas and one is Let me just read it. So we are going to link work from home strategy with performance. That is one contribution that we have given as a study. Adopting technology as one of the strategies from uh, work from home and linking it with the performance of employees and also linking motivation as a strategy to work from home uh, when it comes to performance. And finally, finally our recommendations is that we have to have policies in place in case we are to experience another unforeseen pandemic, adopt to the hybrid work design or the blended work design where we have people come into the office and others being able to work from home, I know there are, there are things we can't do, uh, things like manufacturing, we can't do that from home, uh, where we have machines and all that. But we need to do that to ensure that we can cut on the overhead cost and all that. Uh, private universities to invest in state-of-art technologies, especially when it comes to systems and all that. And effective communication, it should start from the leadership level. Thank you and God bless you. Any questions? Isn't that a fantastic presentation? Okay. How do you how do you propose we clap for her? Zipi? Mbigia Factorio, Emma Nyayo. Zapi? Okay. Bye Factorio. Okay, um, I'm a Bundy. Don't put the microphone down yet. Okay, so um, that was a nice, nice presentation, really, about uh, the future of work and uh, how COVID-19 was the disruptive event that led to the new normal, which has uh, remained sticky. One thing I'm happy about you, or something which is... Uh, really unique about your presentation is um, how exotic it looks, number one. And uh, you have used methodologies which are not common, like the qualitative approach 
is uh, not to me you see so many uh, suggestions in the social sciences but over and above that you came with your mother with your supervisor <laughs> i would wish when i was a phd student my, my supervisor would uh, be going with me to do presentations and stuff like that uh, you, you, you said that uh, we, you have your supervisor in the house let's have you to us please Hello, Lucy. Thank you very much for bringing your daughter around. So we're going to get um, some feedback from Ami Budi's presentation. Any question, feedback, comment, point of input? Let me have... Okay, we have Dr. Nyaribo here. Let me give you this. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, good presentation. Uh, my concern is on uh, you only considered the private university. And uh, when we look at uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, it affected not only the private universities, but also the public universities. So what was the rationale for only choosing the, the private, sorry, the private universities? And uh, secondly, out of the 32 private universities, I think you only considered five or so. Uh, the research could have been more, could have been enriched more if you could have considered more universities. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mbundi. Mine is a comment. That is how good PowerPoint uh, presentation looks like for our students and my colleagues. I liked it. I followed. However, there's a comment you meant, and that reminded me that uh, sometimes we may forget.
transmitted through a chain of images, terms, ideologies, and so on and so forth. So these images, while well, they are just standalone images, when you consume them, when you consume them as the viewer, you can actually pick up um, a culture based on this. You can decide because this is a happy couple, that is the kind of marriage or other wedding that you want to do. You can decide because this is the, like Bonnie has said, this is uh, the, the, the house of a wealthy person. For you to be wealthy, you have to live in a house like this and abandon his manata back in the village. If you can decide uh, for you to have a road trip or go on holiday, you need to do some of the things that these two guys are doing in the car. So basically, the globalization theory talks about all these five scapes and how they contribute to the flow of culture and transfer of culture from one nation to the next. And we are trying to look at now, based on our two superpowers, how are we going to do this? So um, I think I jumped the, 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 the methodology, um, what do you call them, slides. But basically, we are doing a mixed method approach where we have some quantitative data and some qualitative data as we try to break down um, uh, this particular concept. So uh, when we uh, looked at it, um, these are some of the things that came up. The U.S. International Trade Administration put the number of tour foreign tourist arrivals at uh, that number over there. I think our projector in Kidogo, Alex Kuduliko, so in Petitia. But uh, here we are trying to focus on tourists, refugees, guest workers, and exiles as the metrics with which we are able to talk about ethnoscapes. And we are looking at the number of tourists that basically came into the U.S. and the number of tourists that went into China in 2018. We, the study was done in 2020 and we focused on data collected in 2018. So we are looking at that and we are asking ourselves which country has more numbers. So as you can see there, we still have uh, US being a primary destination. Uh, when you look at the foreign student fronts, you see the number of international students studying in China, the number of international students studying in the US. Again, we still have a slight um, lead based on, the, based on uh, uh, American numbers. We have the we have the Chinese daily reporting that 215 foreigners were living in China with work visas in 2018. Uh, some will be considered high-level talents. I think we've talked about the talent market just now. The U.S., however, issued more visas at 590,000 for guest workers in the same period. So again, the U.S. leads in that number. So in terms of uh, ethnoscapes, if we're looking at these five scapes, the U.S. will still come out on top. So if you're looking about where people want to travel, where people want to go, uh, and how that affects culture, the U.S. is still leading in that front. We look at media scape, uh, which is a critical factor right now, and this uh, comparative analysis begins to dive into the media flows from both countries, looking at their media scapes. And about to write a certain image and narrative, what we just talked about, are the central currencies of media flows, how we are able to ascertain that uh, culture is being uh, transferred here. And we have the newspapers, magazines, TV shows, and so on and so forth. So we have a table that basically looks at numbers, and uh, we looked at worldwide circulation as the metrics for measuring this. We looked at international box office revenue as the other metric for measuring this, and international audience size, so that we can we can try to tell how uh, media is uh, disseminated here. So in the U.S., we have, uh, with regards to the newspapers. We had a worldwide circulation of 8.7 million as compared to, that is for US Today, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and so on and so forth. As compared to the People Daily, which is China's biggest newspaper at 2.6 million. Magazines, we had the US magazines again having more worldwide circulation at 9.6 million, as opposed to 0.2 million for China. TV, we have US TV, TV shows being streamed or shown in over 150 countries, as opposed to China, where we had uh, the, some of their shows are being shown only in a majority of 13 countries. And then with regards to film, where uh, uh, the US is still leading, we look at select titles, and we can see that here we had 5.5 billion in terms of international box office revenue, as opposed to in China where we had 0 0.012 billion. So in terms of media scape, we can see that the US is still having a lot of influence in the flow of culture. If, uh, for instance, as Kenyans, we talk about a lot of uh, Chinese impact on culture, I would expect at least one person here is is wearing like the Chinese, or one person here is speaking like the Chinese, or at lunch, you try to use the chopsticks that the Chinese use, but all of us who are basically doing what we are used to seeing on American movies, you use your spoons, I also did see us using our traditional things, so we are basically saying that media scapes is working effectively in Kenya, using us as a, as a study sample. 
When you look at technos yet, um, we will base the comparative analysis on four prominent forms of technology, basically information technology, transport, electronics, and um, I think that's supposed to be information software, or rather information itself. So smartphones and computers were used as samples of information technology, with automobiles standing in for transport, construction equipment, representing industrial machinery, and finally social media networks, which will exemplify the flow of network. So data uh, on the US Chinese exports was sourced from Forbes magazine as indicated there, because most of the formal um, avenues were not accessible using desktop research. So when you look at these numbers again, when you look at the product, the country and the value of the export, in terms of information technology, that is computers, mobile phones, the US exported 37.2 billion won of these materials, while China exported 301.2 billion worth of the same. So basically the US exported 10% only of what China exported in that particular period. In terms of transport, the US exported $2.1 billion worth of uh, aerospace parts, automobiles and everything, while China uh, exported $4.6 billion. In terms of electronics, we had the US exporting $37.7 billion, uh, while China did $84.7 billion, again came on top. And in terms of communication uh, equipment, where we have broadcast equipment and so on and so forth, the US exported $12 billion, while China exported over $231 billion. Again, showing the vast uh, divide that in terms of technology, uh, China is moving across. So it's pretty clear that in terms of technology, China is doing a lot moving forward, or rather going forward. And uh, one of the reasons is we're talking about going into a digital future. The strategy that um, some of the studies that we, we have read uh, show indicate that if they are not able to have their culture disseminated through um, uh, novice, for instance, as uh, the US had a chokehold on that, then in terms of technology, they are doing much better. You will consume American content, but you'll consume it on Chinese uh, platforms and Chinese um, uh, uh, machines, rather. So uh, China has a policy where they want, by 2025, most of the hardware that you'll be using and the software will be made in China by 2025. For those of us who are aware of the big war in the last year of Trump's uh, presidency of TikTok, TikTok ideally is a Chinese website, but the US uh, was laying uh, claims to it. And why? Right now, TikTok has become the biggest website in the world, out, uh, on top of even Google, YouTube, and so on and so forth. So we have an idea why Technoscapes becomes a very pertinent um, issue for both of these superpowers. Then we have Financecapes, where we look at uh, national economies, stock markets, currency markets, uh, which this uh, study will focus on. And according to countryeconomy.com, which is tracking world, leading world economies quarterly, the US economy, or rather GDP, grew at the rate of 2.9% in 2018, uh, while China surpassed them with 6.6%. Uh, uh, we have some figures down there in terms of debt and so on and so forth, where China is doing well in some areas and the US is doing well in some areas. Um, when you look at the stock market, the New York Stock Exchange, which is as old as the years that are written there, becomes the leading one because it's, impo it's almost impossible for Shanghai, Hong Kong, and what have you to catch up to them. So the US is still leading. Front. Um, we look at, uh, so basically in terms of finance caps, the U.S. leads in global financial growth. Right now we know the, ki the kind of challenges you're having, for instance, with the dollar. They're not the same challenges we hear with there. What is the Chinese currency? What? Yes? What? Somebody say yen, wrong, yen is Japanese. It's not yuan. Yes, it's the renminbi. Thank you, Laiponi. So most of you have not heard of the renminbi, but who has not heard of the dollar? Yes, even China, in as much as they want to grow, they will still work with dollars because the U.S. dominates the entire financial market. Then in terms of ideas, we will focus on three factors. That is the opinion polls. And um, in terms of opinion polls, uh, in terms, that is favorability of the U.S. over China. And they were, we found that China enjoyed a 48% popularity as compared to America's 50% in most of the opinion polls that were registered. Uh, that there was a small drop for China. The reason we did focus on uh, the study from 2019 moving forward is because of COVID, because China took a big hit because of COVID. So the studies would have been definitely skewed towards the US. So China's uh, favorability improved in uh, traditionally Western countries like Canada, Australia, and so on and so forth. And then down there we have the second bit, which is the foreign aid, which has been used as a tool for soliciting and forcing ideological cohesion between uh, uh, national nations, rather. And this stretches back to 1949 when the Marshall Plan was enacted by President Truman. 
and basically this program uh, sought to disseminate aid and technical expertise to impoverished areas and I think our country was one of them and the idea was to try and thwart any other allies or other partners coming in but right now we have opened up that space. The adoption of foreign aid as a tool for solicit uh, sorry, all in all, when you look at applying foreign aid as a metric for ideological flow yields at 354.3 billion value for China, uh, right now that is the amount of money that, or rather between 20, 2000 and 2014, that is the amount of money that China gave to allies, while well, at the America, the US gave 394 billion, which is still higher. Then we look at the final um, element of ideascapes, which is cultural institutions, which are another way of basically pushing culture to countries or across borders. And we have the US, which has 307 embassies throughout the world, where its Bureau for Educational and Cultural Affairs helps promote educational, cultural, and professional exchange, uh, which form and maintain the common understanding required in progressing uh, US foreign policy. Cal China has tried to set up Confucius Institutes now to, count to counter this, and we have about 100 of them right now, especially in American universities. The majority of them are in American universities in a clear uh, attempt to try and stem down the American wave. So in conclusion, uh, we find that in as much as we talk about China being a global leader and so on and so forth in many of the things, the U.S. maintains a significant lead in most of the five scapes that we use to study this. Be it in the movement of people, finances, or money, it maintains the power charts, the dynamics of the scapes in which either of the actors are involved. In terms of technology, China has definitely surpassed, and that uh, brings interesting research questions for the future in case we decide uh, to look at whether technology will become uh, the mother of all platforms in terms of finances, in terms of media, in terms of ideas, in terms of ethnicities, because if that's the case, you'll have the U.S. leading in four areas, but in terms of technology, China will still be leading, which carries all that. So we have the, the efforts that have helped China to grow by opening up its borders, um, lowering restrictions on capital flow, issues to do with uh, human rights, and so on and so forth. But the tentative approach to do it is lagging behind for now. So China is touted to take over, but if, if we are looking at empirical facts, then we can all agree that the U.S. has been granted room to shape or allow the takeover to happen. But ideally, the U.S. is still the global superpower. And that is it. There is another image there to try and uh, stimulate the minds. Asante, Dr. Maibon. Wow, who else is impressed by that? of losing Gobia to Nazarene University. He may be pushed. This guy, I never, I, I, I've never seen a presentation by him. But uh, that is fantastic, man. Thank you. Uh, there's a, a public, uh, a, 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 a journal known as Media, Culture, and Society by Sage Publishers. You talk to me, you said this document that gets but oh, it's your PhD thesis, just a paper, you can get it published there. Good, so let's have some questions to that nice, nice piece of work. Thank you, thank you, Kobia, for an exciting presentation. to be reading in a particular election, how would they 
this uh, uh, contest between China and the US sh uh, shaped the military uh, might uh, and uh, the future of also big uh, armed conflicts in the world. Uh, just one.
Yes, good uh, evening everybody. So it has been a very wonderful day for all of us. Uh, first, let me take the opportunity to thank you for your patience. And uh, you've indeed met this particular day a success. Uh, we've had uh, various presentations from uh, the faculty. We've had uh, presentations from the young scholars, as well as uh, in the morning, we had uh, uh, our chief guests and uh, Professor Vitai Nyangamo give us a very insightful uh, message, as far as the theme of our conference is concerned. So for today, we have come to the end of uh, today's uh, presentations. And uh, tomorrow, uh, we will start as per the program. So I request you kindly, tomorrow's day is going to be hectic. It's going to be uh, a very enriching day, uh, given the presentations that have been lined up. So let's be here uh, by 8.30 as per the program, so that we can start on time and be able to complete the activities of the day on time. Um, all right, so uh, for our young scholars, uh, after prayers, uh, Dr. Rotichi would like to meet you briefly before we disperse. So at this point, then I will invite uh, Dr. Mwanzia. I think uh, I heard Dr. Mwanzia was going to give us a closing prayer. So Dr. Terry, welcome. Enjoy the other part of the evening and see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. guys that marks the end of this day straight for swallowship as we head home see you tomorrow at exactly 8.30. Have a beautiful evening.